And we are back on the API product uh, track uh, with a new speaker uh, that I will uh, be glad to uh, introduce. Uh, we will have uh, Shailesh Nalawadi, head of product at Sendbird, who will tell us about how APIs are making innovation exponential. So hello, on Shailesh, how are you? the API product uh, track uh, oh. with the new. Hello, Shailesh, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you, Mehdi, for uh, inviting me here. No, it's a, it's a pleasure. We need to talk about API products. It's great to have someone who is on the product side. So I invite you to uh, share your screen with us and uh, begin the presentation about the API economy. Certainly, my pleasure. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Shailesh Nalawadi, and I'm the head of product for Sendbird. Today, I would like to share with you my perspective on the API economy and its impact on the pace of innovation. My talk actually has uh, three parts. First, I would like to tell you a little bit about Sendbird, so you have some context about uh, you know, our perspective and how we approach this. Next, we will deep dive into some common considerations when using APIs versus you know, building your own. And uh, finally, I will talk to you about some of our customers and how they are turbocharging their product development using APIs. So with that said, uh, let's dive right in. So let's start with Sendbird. Uh, we are the leading user engagement platform for chat, voice, and video apps. Now we've been, uh, we have over 150 million monthly active users on our platform. So clearly we are capable of operating at a very large scale. In fact, we process over two and a half billion messages between users every month. So that's a phenomenal scale. Uh, and we have you know, over a hundred engineers actively building our products and our platform. Uh, and, and we do this, and we build this chat functionality so that you don't have to reinvent it if you decide to incorporate chat into your user experience. Over 100,000 developers from our customer base build on top of our APIs today. And we use the feedback from all of these developers to really continually improve in our product. Now, uh, as I said, I wanted to tell you a little bit about, uh, about Sendbird. Now, ironically, we did not set out to build chat when we started this company. Uh, our company originated as, uh, as Smile Mom, which was a community for mothers. Now, very quickly, we found the need for mothers to communicate with each other over chat. And keeping with our core value, which is endless tenacity for customers, we set out to find a chat solution that could create the best user experience for our customers. After being unable to find a chat solution at that time, um, you know, we decided that we needed to build this chat from ground up for ourselves, taking care of all of the tiniest details of chat experience, like typing indicators, read receipts, online presence indicators, and so on, and doing this at scale. Having done it for ourselves, soon we had our peers coming to us and asking if they could use our chat solution. We actually signed our first chat deal at $50 a month, and very quickly, we had many more of our peers and other startups starting to inquire about our chat offering. So, you know, at that point in time, chat actually became our side hustle, and that was really how Sendbird was born. And if you fast forward to today, five years later, with over 150 million people chatting on our platform on a monthly basis, we've become the number one chat API in the market. Right, And we have an equal number of customers in all of the three major regions of the world, APAC, EMEA, and Americas, which honestly really speaks to the universal appeal of you know, incorporating chat into the user experience. Now, mobile apps are how we get things done in our personal and professional lives from shopping to seeing a doctor, to watching a live stream, and to ordering a food. Right? The, the pandemic has really accelerated the adoption of this trend. And within mobile apps, conversations are conducted with brands and with other users over chat, voice, and video. Now, these could be conversations between a delivery driver and a consumer, a buyer and a seller, or a doctor and a patient. Right? It is this social fabric within the app that really helps these brands acquire, engage with your users, help their customers get what they are looking for, and really retain them. However, building this engagement and communication layer into your mobile app is easier said than done. 
consumers' expectations are constantly evolving as the standalone messenger apps innovate. Uh, for example, switching from a chat to a synchronous voice call with the tap of a button, that's something you know, relatively new. But once you've experienced it, it makes a lot of sense. Consumers expect a seamless chat experience also across devices, networks, and countries. So whether I'm on a website or on my mobile app, I want to be able to communicate with others in, in just the way that I already do. And finally, consumers demand reliability, whether I'm on a Wi-Fi connection at home or on an unreliable 2G network you know, when I'm traveling, I want to be able to have the same experience. So building a feature-rich chat at scale and keeping up with user expectations of what chat could entail is really hard. And um, you know, when uh, smartphone-based chatting first became commonplace, the winners were a few large messenger apps that achieved enough scale to invest the level of resources needed to build a reliable experience. But as I talked about earlier, chat is no longer a standalone product. It is a feature that every app needs from food delivery to entertainment, to education, and to e-commerce, which is why we you know, have invested in and built Sendbird and made the user engagement and communication layer of apps available as an API. Now, every app in the world has access to the same quality of chat as WhatsApp or WeChat with just a few lines of code, no complex backends to manage. And honestly, that's a, that's, you know, a simple example of kind of a revolution of using APIs. Now I'd like to get to the second of, of the three parts of my presentation. Why APIs? Thanks to entrepreneurs building services and offering them as APIs, more and more services are now available as an API. It used to be that there is an app for that. And now, in, in fact, what we say is there is an API for that. So if you think about a typical consumer app, it probably needs to incorporate many of the capabilities listed here on this slide. Identity, payments, translation, SMS, search, location, ability to send emails, and the ability to connect to your financial institution. Today, there are very reputed companies offering APIs for each of these. In identity, you have Okta uh, as an example. In payments, Stripe is a full-featured uh, you know, API. For translation, Google Translate is amazingly accurate. Uh, in SMS, for example, Twilio is a really easy to use API. In location, you have Google Maps. And sending emails reliably at scale is done quite well using SendGrid. And lastly, when it comes to bank transactions, you know, Plaid has made it really easy and secure for apps to connect to uh, their consumers, you know, banking uh, institutions. So let's look at the scenarios where it makes sense for an app to go with an API rather than trying to build the feature themselves, right? And I've, and I've kind of created these, these five typical uh, phrases that you hear in the context of, you know, a build versus, you know, buying an API. One is it's hard and messy. The simple version of a service is deceptively simple and, and easy to implement. But once you factor in regulatory compliance, scalability, multiple client platforms, et cetera, it becomes significantly more complex of an implementation. And you may not have all the skills in your team to really implement it correctly. That's a good sign you know, in terms of the API versus building it. Next one is everybody has it. All of your competitors offer this. So in your industry, this is what we call table stakes, which means that you won't get credit for having this feature, but you may lose customers if you don't have it. The next uh, you know, interesting phrase that you hear is, oh, it's so common that end users take it for granted. This is honestly a variation of the previous point, but from the perspective of user experience. This is a feature that your users will, won't notice unless it, it doesn't work really well. Uh, next thing, it should just work. The bar is really high, and, the, and it's likely so because there are standalone apps that have set a very high stand, you know, standard for usability. For example, in chat services, you know, uh, WhatsApp, WeChat, KakaoTalk, Facebook Messenger have continually innovated on usability. Uh, and the last one is, typically not the focus of the business itself. What this means is you have an engineering team that you've put together to solve a consumer problem. It was not easy to find the engineers, but you've got this team. And you really want them focused on solving the problems that you and only you can solve. 
and you don't want them solving things that everybody else has already solved. So focus, and if focus is something you need to do, then you know, an API approach is probably right for you. So bringing this all together, entrepreneurs can today can assemble an experience rather than having to build it all by themselves. And as a simple example, Hinge, one of our customers, uses APIs from Facebook, Google Maps, and Sendbird to create a location-aware dating experience. The other thing to note is that APIs actually de-risk your investment by helping you focus on the core. With APIs, you get the power of a company who does that one thing for a living and nothing else, such as us in Sandbird when it comes to chat. Um, think about a dating app that could be focused on user acquisition and matching. If their chat feature goes down, the users can't interact and will be upset. But that is not a feature that would lead to such a big loss in loyalty for the app. It is a solved problem. So it's worth considering using it uh, via an API. And just like you wouldn't think of building your own data center anymore, you will, after all, today use AWS, uh, or your own single sign-on capability, or your payment gateway, there are a lot of things that now you can actually use as an API. Uh, and the last point I'll make is that you, know, you, you assume that certain parts of your apps are infrastructure that needs to be rock solid, available for your users in a reliable, consistent way. And it's not something that you, know, you want to invest your um, SRE uh, resources and, and operations resources in making sure that it's up and running. So you know, putting it all together, APIs really give you that peace of mind so that, as I said, you can focus on the areas where you are differentiated. And uh, entrepreneurs now will only have to build the part that makes them unique, and they can get off-the-shelf components for almost every other part of the app, from authentication to payments to communication. So much of the user experience uh, in most B2C apps is now available as a building block from an API vendor. So with, with all of this explanation about APIs and how you can move quickly, I thought it would be good to talk about practical examples uh, from the roster of customers that Sendbird has, right? These are companies that are confidently accelerating their product development using our APIs. Uh, and let's start with Reddit, right? Reddit needs no introduction. They have built a remarkable community of engaged users. Now, chat is a hard and messy problem to build at scale. And the product team at Reddit honestly hadn't realized how hard it was to build at scale until they actually built their own internal version. Now, with Sendbird, Reddit was able to get to market faster and also meet their users really high bar. So introducing you know, person to person chat inside of you know, Reddit is a feature that really increased the 30 day retention of Reddit more than almost any other new feature that they had introduced previously. So it was a phenomenal success for them. Now let's talk about Paytm. Now Paytm is an expert and leader in payments based out of India. Now, India is a market that has enthusiastically adopted cross-platform chat from Facebook and WhatsApp. And so when they thought about uh, you know, the payments experience, they realized that you know, this is a feature that everybody's already accustomed to and many of their competitors already had. So digital wallets like Paytm have realized that they're, you know, they're not just about money transfer, but in fact, more about fostering the relationship between the participants in a financial transaction. And as payments become more social, they have started to use Sendbird chat to connect their users in a conversation as part of the payment exchange. In some sense, it's very similar to Venmo here in the United States, but you know, copied and localized for uh, their market. And they've done it you know, really well, and, and we're really proud to you know, support them as they've scaled uh, you know, exponentially. The next example that I'd like to use is uh, from the healthcare space. So here, you know, the, the concept is that chat is already common and consumers already take it for granted, uh, especially when you try to introduce the chat into a different setting, such as healthcare. So Accolade is a personalized health and benefits solution that dramatically increases, improves the experience, outcomes, and cost of healthcare for employers and health plans and their, and their members. They're based out of the United States. Now, patients of all age groups have increasingly started to prefer communicating with healthcare representatives over chat, owing to, you know, it's just easy and it's asynchronous and you don't have to wait on a phone call and be put on hold. And 
Accolade has really improved patient responsiveness significantly by adding Sendbird chat to their patient communication, right? And here, they, they don't really didn't, didn't really need to, to train their users because their users already knew what chat was like, but they just wanted to chat with their with their doctor and their nurses, and that's what we were able to help them do. Here's another example from a different domain, and this time it's e-commerce. Um, Carousel is a consumer to consumer and business to consumer marketplace for buying and selling new and secondhand goods. They operate in Southeast Asia, a market where consumers have also ad enthusiastically adopted messenger apps. And uh, with Sandberg, Carousel could focus on reimagining the buying and selling experience and actually imagining the experience by integrating buyer to seller chat deeply into the buying and selling, transacting, and review workflow. And they were able to do all of this without having to worry about chat once uh, because they are partnered with Sendbird and we just provide the underlying chat as an infrastructure and it just works. And uh, the next example is one that I've alluded to before. And, and this is uh, Hinge, the dating application. Now uh, for Hinge, you know, it, chat is important, but not really the focus of the business itself, right? Chat Hinge's uh, differentiation is by improving the match rates and creating better recommendation algorithms in the dating space so that people that are looking to date can connect in the real world in the quickest way possible with uh, compatible um, matches. Uh, Sandbird allowed Hinge to, to channel their resources into creating better algorithms and, and end user experiences, which created true differentiation of their app in the, in the dating space. And uh, to quote their CFO, um, we decided on Sandbird primarily for two reasons. The products seem very much in line with our needs, i.e. a full featured chat service. And Sandbird's client base gave us confidence that we would be able to handle our traffic and projected growth, which is a very typical sentiment that we see from our customers, right? There is almost a sense of like, well, uh, relief in the sense that we, we've got a partner that handles all the hard work so that we can focus on the things that really drive our business. So at Sendbird, we're proud that industry leaders and some of the largest apps in the world have chosen Sendbird to power their digital interactions. All of these apps are able to focus on what they do best and leave the engagement and communication over chat, voice, and video to us. So um, that you know, is an example of how APIs really foster uh, an explosion of innovation. And we are really proud to be a part of this. So with that, I'd like to end my presentation and thank you. Thank you very much, Alesh. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, at the opening of the conference, we talked about, uh, you know, the digital supply chain that EPIs are providing, right? And that at some point, and this is also the theme of the event, you know, it's API all the way down. It's someone using a, having a product, consuming an API, this API consume other API that consume other API up to the infrastructure, right, layer. So is it a little bit what you are telling us here so that everybody will uh, produce core value proposition delivered through APIs, but will consume core value proposition of others directly via APIs, right? Yeah, yeah, very much so. So I actually really like the term that you use, right? Digital supply chain, because it is it, it, it really, I think, encapsulates the fact that there are a lot of building blocks that can be put together to, uh, to in some sense, uh, assemble the experience that you are trying to create for your end users that you and uniquely are able to do. and and the supply chain exists and it's sophisticated and, and very mature to, to help you with, with that assembly. So for example, what advice would you, could you give to people when they have to decide to integrate an API or not? For example, the Sandbird APIs, you know, at some point they have a build versus buy option, right? Indeed. So when would you, what advice you would give about the build versus buy option? Right. And uh, I think that that is, uh, you know, part of what I touched on in my presentation. Right? There are these very common questions that you have. Like, yes, this is an important part of my experience, but is it the most important differentiator? I think the answer to that will get to how much you want to invest in it. Um, you know, is it something that is kind of, you know, as we said, table stakes in, in your industry where everyone has it and it's kind of expected, but if you don't have it, you know, it is noticed. In that case, you know, that's not an area of differentiation and you should look into whether you can do it. And I think the third thing is, are people at are your peers, uh, companies that are operating at your scale, are they 
you know, able to, uh, you know, uh, use a chat API or not, or are they doing something similar? If they are, once again, it just probably means that there's no point in you differentiating in an area like this, you should probably partner with an API company. So there are a few really common questions uh, that you can work through. Uh, but I, the, the last, maybe most important point as a, as a member of the product team, and as a key person in the company, hiring is difficult. Engineering resources are scarce. And you know, when you've got a, a team that you put together, you want them focusing on the thing that makes the most difference for your product. And that should be the areas where you differentiate not the area where kind of you are, you know, just as good as anyone else. To, to, to me, like that, especially at this moment in time, with how difficult it is to put together an engineering team, that to me is, is the key in the build versus buy debate. It's a, it's a really interesting topic that some companies who are the best talent can build the best product that other probably can't. So you, it's not only just the API, it's the humans behind the API that you kind of hire as a service. In, Correct. In world, right? I love I love this analogy. Um, I have uh, there is a question also for you about uh, you know you demonstrated like some you know uh, like a, a nuts and bolts of the API economy you know search SMS whatever payment you know you were telling that we have this this but then what is the next generation of API products you know because the first one you showed were quite transactional it was really like mm -hmm. you know mailing or stuff like that but the next one like do, can we try to explore what would be the, the advanced you know, processes directly delivered by API or business processes as, uh, as an API? Yeah, I think that as in everything in, in, uh, in, in business and technology, there is a trend towards kind of more integration and more integrated services offered as you know, you know, one API. Right um, Today, for example, Sendbird you know, supports many um, live events providers you know, such as, you know, the, the provider that, that, you know, allows us to have this uh, event, right? Now, if you look at what this event is doing, they have chat services, they have video services, and they have, you know, these um, uh, user interaction and kind of marketing and, and, and a lightweight CRM kind of built into it, right? And in some sense, there is going to, the, the trend is going to be like, do I really need a different provider for each of these things? So you can imagine that there is a layer you know, between the events provider and someone like Sendbird who says like, you know what, I can put together the video, the chat and the CRM into one integrated service, right? And so in fact, all of us in the API business also think about it, right? Do I move up the chain and integrate more services to create a more seamless developer experience? Or do I disaggregate and unpack parts of what I do because there's a demand for it, right? And uh, you know, one of my and a most uh, uh, an expression that I really remember from from Silicon Valley, and I'm not sure who it, this is attributed to. It says that you know, uh, in, in Silicon Valley, there's really only two business models, right? There is bundling and unbundling, and and so in some sense, those are the two approaches that you can take as an, as a provider in the API. Do I bundle more to create a more opinionated uh, set of services because my customers demand it? Or do I unbundle what I've done because a portion of what I've built, in fact, is really attractive? Both are interesting strategies. Uh, and I think you know, have, having your customers kind of explain to you how they use your service will give you a clue uh, as to which way you can go as a provider. And, and I think that's a great sum up about the API economy. It's bundle or unbundle, right? Bundle for more advanced processes and services to be delivered you know, uh, in a complex uh, uh, and maybe delivered also by an API, but at least, you know, like uh, complex solutions or unbundle the nuts and bolts of the digital supply chain. So to be integrated everywhere, you know, the right. Sunbird, the, the Sunbird chat can be integrated, I'm sure in any application, right? And the more application need chat, the more they will be able to consume Sunbird APIs, right? That mm -hmm. totally makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and and actually, you know, it's it's the perfect timing. So thank you, Shailesh, for uh, this presentation. And again, uh, you really opened our eyes about the API economy. And I again, I'll I'll, I'll ask everybody who who's listening to remember the API economy is about bundling or unbundling, uh, gathering many different solutions into one, or dividing into smaller pieces that you can sell or at least distribute to anyone. Thank you, Shailesh. Thank you.